It's very touching to see my grandma and grandpa. I was talking to Adam Rennie, our worship leader, lost both of his parents just a, in the same year, a couple of years ago. And when we get where we're going, we're gonna see them again. How many are grateful for that great hope one day? We're in this series that we're calling, What Did Jesus Say About That? And we've said that Jesus was the, the master. He was the smartest man that ever walked on planet Earth. And we've been talking about what it would be like to sit at his feet and be his apprentices and learn from him about how to live life and how to get the most out of this life. And so today we're going to talk about what did Jesus say about the afterlife? More specifically, what did Jesus say about heaven. Now, over the years, I've been uh, sort of a fan of, you know, funny epitaphs. And uh, I thought I'd share a couple of these with you here this morning. These are epitaphs, real epitaphs on tombstones. Here lies the body of Mary Ann Brown. At death, she weighed 400 pounds. But now in sweet repose, she rests in peace on Abraham's breast. A little boy came along and added these few words. Well, it may be sweet for Mary Ann, but it's awful tough on Abraham. (laughs) Now, here's another epitaph, a real epitaph on a tombstone. And uh, I hesitated to share it in this, you know, uh, identity-confused world we're living in. But I think you'll get the idea. Here lies an man who lived an old maid but died an old man. Some of you will get that on the way home today, all right? (laughs) One day, a Sunday school teacher was trying to teach her students how to get to heaven. And so she asked her students, if I volunteered all my time and really helped people, would that get me to heaven? And all the kids yelled out, no. She said, well, if I, you know, gave all my money to the poor and fed all the hungry people, would that get me to heaven? And all the young people yelled out, no. She said, well, if I was kind to all the little stray puppy dogs and I was good to my friends and really loved my family, would that get me to heaven? And the kids yelled out, no. And she said, well, then how do I get to heaven? And one boy yelled out, you got to be dead. I love that story. And it's true. If Jesus doesn't return soon to take us home in the rapture, the only way to get to heaven is to die. And so the good news is all of us here today have the opportunity to go to heaven because the death rate in this country still hovers around 100%. Uh, Unless Jesus returns, you are going to die. Uh, A recent Gallup poll, by the way, have you noticed that not too many churches talk about heaven anymore? You hardly ever hear heaven talked about. I don't know why. Maybe some pastors feel like it's, you know, not intellectual to to talk about heaven and the idea of an afterlife. Uh, Maybe some pastors think that it's, you know, it would cause people to be so heavenly minded they would be no earthly good. But that's not my experience. I think most Christians are so earthly minded they're no heavenly good. We need to be more heavenly minded. But when when the church doesn't have heaven on its mind, what happens is it becomes self-centered and it becomes weak and it becomes consumed by present day pursuits, pushing thoughts of the afterlife to a mere afterthought. A recent Gallup poll uh, shared that there's virtually no difference, catch this, in the moral lives and moral stances of Christians and non-Christians. And I think one of the reasons for that can be laid at the feet of this, this great omission of the teaching about heaven in the church. Listen, friends, when we forget that God has prepared for us a glorious place called heaven for all of eternity, when we begin to doubt that or push that off our radar, we will soon start to go to extremes trying to create heaven on this earth. We'll spend every penny we can trying to make heaven on this earth. We'll we'll buy all the toys we can. We'll try to live in the most elaborate mansions that we possibly can because we want to experience heaven. I want to tell you, no matter how, how far you go or how much you imagine or dream, you can never recreate heaven on this earth. It's virtually impossible. All of us in this place, we have to understand, have a hunger for heaven. It's in your heart. 
And if you don't understand that, and if you don't feed that hunger with the spiritual truths of God's word, then you will try to replace heaven with cheap substitutes on this earth that will never give you heaven, okay? So today we're gonna talk about what did Jesus say about heaven? I wanna share with you three observations here today about heaven. And you're gonna see the words of Jesus sprinkled all throughout these three observations. Here's the first one. Heaven is popular in the human heart. Heaven is popular in the human heart. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has planted eternity, that's heaven, in the human heart. A mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy. Look, there's a longing in your heart for heaven. There's a drive in your heart for heaven. And it's true of every human being. And that's why heaven keeps popping up all over our culture. First of all, heaven is popular among writers. At this time, right now, as I speak, there are two books on the New York Times bestsellers list about heaven. One is called Life After Death, The Burden of Proof. And one is called One Minute After You Die. You see, heaven is a very popular subject among writers. Heaven is also very popular among musicians. I've lost count of how many artists over the years have written songs about heaven. I could be here all day listing the songs. People like Lady Gaga, Bono, Journey, Brian Adams, Guns N' Roses, Eric Clapton, Mariah Carey, Jay-Z, Run DMZ, Elvis Presley. Heaven is very, very popular among the artists of our world. Heaven is also very popular among movie makers. There are way too many movies even to list that talk about or themed about heaven. So I created this little mosaic behind me here to show you, you know, all the movies made over the years about heaven among movie makers. Because heaven is very popular among movie makers. And heaven is popular in the Bible. There are over 500 verses in the Bible about heaven. If you took all those out of the book, out of the Bible, you couldn't have a Bible. It'd just be a, a mishmash that really didn't make any sense. Heaven is popular among writers and rock stars in Hollywood. It's popular in the Bible. It's just maybe not as popular in our hearts as it ought to be. Number two. And by the way, that's why every year we have devoted, this church has devoted itself to doing a message about heaven every single year. And I hope you appreciate that in a church culture that doesn't talk about heaven at all anymore. Number two. Heaven... Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. By the way, did you know that the Bible talks about three different heavens? It's true. Some of you are like, I can't even wrap my brain around one heaven. And you're telling me there's three heavens. Well, when the apostle Paul is writing his second letter to the church at Corinth, he mentions that he was caught up into the third heaven. And uh, so if there is a third heaven, it only goes to reason that there'd be two other heavens as well. Let me tell you about these three heavens briefly. The first heaven is called the atmospheric heaven. It's the heaven mentioned several times in scripture. I'll give you one example, Genesis 1.20. Then God said, let the waters be full of living things. Let the birds fly above the earth in the open space of the heavens. So the heavens, this first heaven, the atmospheric heaven, is the heaven that blankets the earth where birds fly and where clouds sit and the sun fills the clouds and it's so beautiful, the the, the southwestern skies during a sunset. That's the atmospheric heaven. Second heaven is called the stellar heaven, Genesis 1.14. Then God said, let there be lights in the open space of the heavens to divide day from night. Let them tell the days and years and times of the year. And it was so. Then God made the two great lights, the brighter light to rule the day and the smaller light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God put them in the open space of the heavens to give light on the earth. So the second heaven is something known as the outer space. That's where the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the galaxies exist. Now look this way, everybody. Then there's something called the third heaven. The third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says this, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Now, a week from Sunday, we're gonna have a man here named Bill Weiss. 
And he maintains that he was also caught up, much like the Apostle Paul, but he was caught up not into heaven, he was caught up into hell. And he was shown what hell really is all about. I want you to invite all your friends and loved ones a week from this coming, well, next for Father's Day also, but especially for this message about what Jesus said about hell. I think it's gonna be very enlightening. And Paul says, whether I was in my body or out of my body, only God knows. But I do know that I was caught up in paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. So Paul talks about a third heaven. And this is the heaven where God resides. And we're told over and over in the Bible that God is in heaven. Jesus told us to pray. Our Father who are in, say it. Jesus also said, let your light shine bright before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So God's residence isn't the atmospheric heaven or the, you know, the, the stellar heaven. It's the third heaven. It's the heaven of all heavens. And this is the heaven that those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we're gonna be in that heaven with God for all of eternity. Now, some of you hear that and say, well, look, that's good that I know that there's three heavens and that the, the third heaven is the heaven of heavens where God reside, resides. But why do I need to know that? This is so important. One day, Jesus told his disciples, and by the way, we are all his disciples. We are his apprentices. We're learning from him. And he told them, I'm gonna go to the cross. I'm gonna be nailed to a cross and give up my life and be buried in the ground, in a tomb rather. And then I'm gonna be resurrected from the dead and then I'm going to ascend. I'm gonna leave you and go away to be with my father who is in heaven. And when the disciples heard this, their hearts were broken. Their hearts were filled with sorrow. And so Jesus gave them this, this word. They didn't know where he was going or how to get where he was going. And so Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. For where I am, there you may be also. Well, remember Dodd and Thomas? Uh, Thomas was confused. He didn't understand. He said in verse five, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? G Thomas didn't understand back then what we know today because we have the Bible, but Jesus was promising something to his disciples. What was he promising? He was promising, verse two, I go to prepare a place for you. Look at me, friends. Heaven is real. Heaven is a real place. In fact, there are many metaphors in the Bible that share a vision for how real of a place heaven is. Heaven is referred to as a country, which speaks of the vastness of its territory. It's referred to as a celestial city. Cities have inhabitants and marketplaces and commerce. Heaven is called a kingdom, which brings all these images of organization and government and process. But the best explanation of heaven of all, in my opinion, is where Jesus says in verse two, it's my father's house. Heaven is my father's house. Some of you are like me. You grew up in a home that was very warm and very loving. And it conjures up great memories of our father's house. Growing up in my father's house, I have these wonderful memories of my dad. He used to wake us up in the morning because my mom couldn't get us out of bed. So he would come and kind of crawl in between Matthew and I. We shared a king-size waterbed. Those are very popular back in the days. Some of you are smiling, you know exactly. They still make waterbeds today. I don't see waterbeds anymore. But he would crawl in between us, and we were, we were athletes, and so he was always rubbing our legs in the morning and rubbing our back, and I love you boys so much. And, and uh, one morning, he couldn't get us out of bed. He told us, he got up and left, he said, come on, and we didn't get out of bed. So we ran back in, and he jumped right in the middle of the waterbed, and the waves just threw us right out of bed. <laughs> but I have so many warm memories. One time, we lived over in Moon Valley, and there was a mountain right behind our fence. 
and the mountain caught on fire. It was a big story in the paper. And my dad said, boys, I want you to go out there and grab the hose, try to put that fire out. So here's me, 12 years old, and Matthew, seven years old, with a, with a couple hoses out there trying to put out this big fire. And we were on the front page of the Phoenix Gazette newspaper back in those days. Pretty amazing. We have all these warm and amazing memories of our father's house. And then when I went off to college, and Matthew and Christy and I, we got too old, dad downsized, and he sold that house. Dad, I've never forgiven you for selling that house to this day because there's something very intimate and sweet and precious about heaven. When you think of heaven being your father's house, you have a a picture in your mind. You think of decorations and you think of furniture. You have memories. There's a sense of security. There's nothing like the father's house. Some of you this morning, you're hearing all these stories about my father's house, and you're saying, that wasn't my experience in my father's house. I have bad experiences, but I want you to know if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, he says, I'm preparing a house for you, and the father's house in heaven is better than any house that any father on planet earth could create. I'm trying to tell you this morning, there's a real place, heaven. This is not an imaginary place. This is not a state of mind. This is not a vision of a long for utopia. Utopia. Our thoughts don't create heaven. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. How many are grateful for that this morning? This is not a home. There's a greater home. Then third and last, we're almost done. Heaven is also a precious place. It's a precious place. Now, why do I say that? Why is heaven a precious place? Because everything that's near and dear and very precious to people who know Jesus and love Jesus is in heaven. Think about it. First of all, our Redeemer, Jesus, is in heaven. Hebrews 9.24 says, Christ did not go into the most holy place made by humans, which is which is only a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself and is there now before God to help us. Friends, look at me, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, is in heaven. And I have a feeling that one day when you and I arrive in heaven and we begin to see all those things that we've imagined heaven to be like, streets of gold, the celestial sea. Can you imagine that? The Bible says there's 12 gates in heaven. Each gate is made with its own separate pearl, one pearl making up a gate hundreds of feet high. People say, man, I want to see that pearl. No, I want to see the oyster who made that pearl. Amen. We're going to see all these amazing things. I'm going to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and begin to talk to them. I'm going to see Pastor Leo Godzic, who is a hero of this church. He's probably up there right now lecturing the Apostle Paul on theology. Don't Leo. Listen, all these things are going to fade into insignificance. When we finally look into the face of Jesus, the one I gave my life to, the one I preached about, the one I I gave my tithe and offering and resources to my whole life, the one that I've just given all my attention to in my life. I'm going to see him face to face. And when we see Jesus face to face, all those things will fade into significance because Jesus Christ is the heaven of heavens. When we see him face to face. And friends, I believe in heaven that the image of Jesus will be the sacrificial lamb of God. And we will see the scars in his hands and his feet. And we will be forever reminded that it was only because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross that we are in heaven. But we're going to see him face to face. Secondly, our relationships are in heaven. How many here today, show of hands, would say there's someone in your family or a friend who you knew they love Jesus and they're in heaven today? Raise your hand real high. Look at that. Amazing. I was talking to... Angel, about a month ago, and Angel's dad was a wonderful man of God. He built a great big business, really an empire, and he he did it just to give to God's work. That's why he lived and breathed. He wanted to push God's kingdom forward and just be a giver, and he was. 
Well, he died several years ago, about, about 10, 15 years ago now. I remember we used to go up to the cabin in Coeur d'Alene Lake, and we'd get off the airplane, and every time Ed would, would grab Angel's face like this and put his hands around her face, and he would just look at her and just start laughing. I don't know what he was laughing about, but he got such joy in seeing Angel. And then he would kiss her cheek while his hands were cupped around her face. It was really a tender moment. And I reminded Angel of that about a month ago, and I said, you know, there's gonna be a day when you get to heaven and you're gonna see your daddy again, and he's gonna grab your cheeks again, and he's gonna laugh, and he's gonna kiss your cheeks. What a day that's going to be. People sometimes ask, will I be able to recognize my family in heaven? Well, when Jesus was raised from the grave, he was given a glorified, resurrected body and people could recognize him. So it only goes to reason if people could recognize Jesus in his glorified body, then you will be able to be recognized and recognize your family in heaven. And friends, this is gonna be one of the most glorious, wonderful parts about being in heaven. I read a poll not too long ago that said, who would you most like to see first in heaven? 31% of people said, my mother. 16% said, my father. Only 10% said, my spouse. (laughs) Now, I don't even know why I shared that this morning, but just let the Holy Spirit minister today, amen. (laughs) Number three, why is heaven so precious? Our resources are in heaven. Look at 1 Peter 1, verse three. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Listen, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, God becomes your father in heaven and you become his heir. You are an heir of God, and now you have an inheritance. And Peter is saying here that this inheritance is waiting for you in heaven today. It can never be taken away from you. It can't be taken away by inflation or by a slumping economy. You have an inheritance that's prepared for you in heaven. Number four, our residence is in heaven. Now listen carefully. I love the great country of the United States of America. How many of you love this great nation we live in? But listen, our citizenship isn't in the United States. Our ultimate citizenship. Paul says it like this, our citizenship is in heaven. We are not citizens of this land. This is not our homeland. We have a homeland in heaven. And if we forget that, then we will not represent Jesus Christ on this earth the way we should. Because this is not our home. I I renewed my passport just a few weeks ago, and I had to put down where I was born. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and now I reside in Maricopa County. But friends, this is just my temporary home. The Bible says we are strangers and aliens on this planet. There's a greater home waiting for us one day. Um, some of you saw this video, but there were three girls who were the stars of the Oklahoma Sooners women's softball team. They won the national championship, the World Series, again this year, three years in a row. And they were interviewed after they won the national championship. And I thought they had such a great perspective on citizenship and where their real home lies. Take a look at this. Start with ESPN for, for the players. I know you talked about keeping the joy of the game, but I'm curious. It's a long season, right? And you guys have had the target on your back the entire time, the win streak being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that could very easily set in? Well, the only way that you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances and outcomes. Um, I think Coach has said this before, but joy from the Lord is really the only thing that can keep you motivated, um, uh, just in a good 
mindset, uh, no matter the outcomes. Thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, uh, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, and all of that. So uh, I would, that's really the only, the only answer to that because there's no other way that softball can bring you that um, because of how much failure comes in it and just how much of a roller coaster the game can be. 1,000% agree with Grace Lyons. Um, I went through that my freshman year. I I was so happy to win the call. I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't have, I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled, and I had to find Christ in that. And I think that is what makes our team so strong is that, we're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world if we do lose. Yes, obviously we've worked our butts off to be here and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and and our love for each other and our love for the game, because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with Um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for, and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really, like, shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, And I think that's just what brings me so much joy and no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home. And I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And, yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home. And um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So, Patty, uh, you've got to keep your Isn't that beautiful? When you remember where your citizenship lies, that this is not your home, this is your temporary home, and when you remember that heaven is your real home, that you'll operate differently on earth, you'll take those moments to praise Jesus when he gives you a win and praise Jesus in culture and stand for Jesus in the culture. Number five, our reward is in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you. A lot of insulting going on today against the faith movement. Persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Now, friends, look at me. Did you know that the Bible says that there's five crowns that you can win on this earth by the way that you live your life for Jesus on this earth? Some of you have never heard this before. The Bible says there's five different crowns that one day you could be presented in heaven for the way you've conducted your life on this earth. Let me just share these with you real quick. First of all, there's a crown of victory, 1 Corinthians 9. It's been said that good is the enemy of best. And this is the crown that's given to those people like you who have narrowed the focus of their life so that they can focus their life on what is eternally important. They've won a victory over something. It's called a victor's crown. They've won a victory over pride or over pornography or over something that plagues them in their life. And they will be given a crown one day because they had victory. There's also a crown of rejoicing. It's also called the crown of soul winning. First Thessalonians, you might want to take pictures of these and look them up. This is given to people who focus their life, listen, on winning people to Jesus Christ, on taking people with them to heaven. I was pulling out of my driveway last week and my neighbor, 
He's a Greek man named Costa. He attends our Scottsdale campus. And he said, Pastor Barnett, please pray for me. I said, why? He said, I purchased my plane tickets. I'm going back to Greece where my relatives live. They don't know the Lord. And I've asked the team of the Scottsdale campus to pack up communion for me. I'm going to go there, put them all in one room and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe they're going to be saved and take communion for the first time. Man, I laid hands on him right in the middle of our street. And I began to pray God's anointing and God's power upon his life. Listen, Costa is going to get the crown of rejoicing. The crown of soul winning. Last night, a group of 16 young adults from the Scottsdale campus went down to Scottsdale Quarter. And they began to invite people to church and hand out information about the church and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. People were saved. People were in tears last night. Those kids are going to get a crown one day, the Bible says. There's also a crown of righteousness. This is given to those people who love Jesus so much and they love the thought of heaven so much that they crucify those things in their life through the power of God and God's grace so they can live righteous lives. They don't just coast through life. They want to be righteous for God and there's going to be a crown. There's also the crown of life. And this is given to believers who love Jesus so much, don't miss this, that they're willing to withstand the persecution and the temptation, even martyrdom in the name of Jesus Christ. This is reserved for those Christians who've kept the faith. Come on, Christians, keep the faith. I'll say it again. We gotta keep the faith. We gotta hold the line. And the Bible says, if you will, there's a crown coming for you in heaven. And the last one is the crown of glory. And this one's given to the pastors and the, and the shepherds and the elders and the, the deacons of the church and those who lead ministries in the church. Many of you lead ministries here in the church. There is going to be a crown for you. Now, here's my question to you this morning. Now that you know about these crowns, are you running for a crown? Are you actively pursuing a crown? Well, Luke, it doesn't sound real spiritual to want a reward from God. Why not? The Bible says that God's really into rewards. All throughout the Bible, we see God motivating his people through rewards. Why? Because he wants us to be faithful soldiers of Jesus Christ. So he holds before us these crowns. And he says that one day when you get to heaven, listen now, you're going to be in a long line of people and they're all holding their crowns. One by one, walking up to the feet of Jesus and kneeling and placing their crown at the, at the feet of Jesus Christ, the King of glory. So let's go there for a moment. Imagine you're in that line. And you see this long line of people with tears placing their crown at the feet of Jesus one by one. And you get to the front. And you look in Jesus' eyes the one who died for you, the one who gave all for you. And you say, well, Jesus, I love you too. Jesus, I knew all about you too. And I gave my life to you and I, I received your gift of salvation, but I never want a crown for you. Friends, on that day, you will have wished that you won a crown. What do you say? Let's be people who go after crowns for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number six, our riches are in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What an interesting line. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now you've all heard it said, you can't take it with you when you go. And while that may be true, you can send it ahead of you. You can send your treasures ahead of you. And the only way you can get treasure from earth into heaven is by investing your treasure, your time, your talents and treasures in the two things that are going to heaven. And there's only two things going to heaven, friends. That's people 
The souls of mankind will never die. And also the word of God. I, I know some of you in this place, you've been good investors of your resources. And when you invest, the question you always have is, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment? But if you're here today and you're interested in enjoying an EROI, an eternal return on your investment, then I would encourage you right now to begin to think about an eternal strategy while you begin to invest some of your time, talents, and treasures in the only two things that are gonna pierce the veil from this life to the next life. And that's people, and that's the word of God. I'd like you to think through that because Jesus said that one day when you get to heaven, if you send your treasures ahead, you will enjoy them for all of eternity. What a great thought. And then last, our reservation is in heaven. Our reservation is in heaven. This is the most important thing of all. Revelation 21, 27 says this, nothing evil will be allowed to enter nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. According to the Bible, there's a book in heaven that has a place for every single human being, a slot for every human being, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be allowed into heaven. So I want to ask you this morning as we close, is your name written in heaven? Is it? Because one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? And if you cannot say, I'm absolutely confident that because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and the commitment I made to him, my name is written in heaven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. My reservation is in heaven. Friends, if you're not absolutely confident of that, you're not going to get into heaven, according to Jesus. I just wanna close with this final story and then we'll have a time of prayer. Ruth Anna Mesger is a professional singer and she tells a story of how she received an invitation by one of the wealthiest families in all of Seattle to sing at the daughter uh, of this family in the wedding. She was very excited about this for two reasons. First of all, it was a huge city event. Everyone knew about it. The elites would be there and she would be the vocalist. Number two, the reception after the wedding was gonna be held at the top two floors of Seattle's Columbia Tower, the Northwest tallest skyscraper. And she just let her mind roam about how beautiful and wonderful it would be to have her and her husband attend the reception at this place. Wedding day came and she sang and it was beautiful. When it was over, they drove to the Columbia Towers and when they entered in, it was even more beautiful than she imagined. There were waiters, she writes, wearing snappy black tuxedos who offered luscious hors d'oeuvres and exotic beverages for, most, for the most discriminating of tastes. The atmosphere was one of grace and sophistication. After about an hour of merriment, the bride and groom approached. They approached a beautiful brass staircase that led to the top floor. A satin ribbon, which was draped around the bottom of the stairs, was cut. And the announcement was made that the wedding feast was about to begin. The bride and groom ascended the stairs and the guests followed closely behind. A gentleman with, gentleman with a lovely bound book greeted us as we reached the top of the stairs. May I have your name, please? Well, I am Ruth Anna Mesger and this is my husband, Roy Mesger. I replied, the gentleman searched the M's. I'm not finding it. Would you spell it, please? I spelled it slowly and clearly. After searching through the book, the gentleman looked up and said, I'm sorry, but your name is not here. Without your name in this book, you cannot attend the banquet. Oh, there must be some mistake, I replied. I'm the singer. I sang in the wedding. It could be, I'm a pastor. I preached at the church. 
I'm a Sunday school teacher. I taught little children. I was a worship leader. I sang in the church. She said, you have to let me in. I sang. The gentleman calmly answered, it doesn't matter who you are or what you did. Without your name in the book, you cannot attend this banquet. The gentleman motioned to a waiter, show these people to the service elevator, please. We follow the waiter past beautiful decorated tables laden with shrimp, whole smoked salmon, and gracefully carved ice sculptures. Adjacent to the banquet area was an orchestra, its members all dressed in dazzling white tuxedos, preparing to fill the room with glorious music. We were led to the service elevator, stepped in, and the waiter pushed G for garage. As Roy drove out of the Columbia Tower garage, we both remained silent. Then after driving several miles in silence, Roy reached over and gently put his hand on my arm. Sweetheart, what happened? Then I remembered when the invitation arrived for the reception, I was very busy and I never bothered to return the RSVP. Besides, I was a singer. Surely I could go to the reception without returning the RSVP. As we drove home, I began to weep and cry. I was not weeping because I just missed the most lavish banquet of my life, but I was weeping suddenly because I understood what it would be like someday for people as they stand before Christ and find out that their names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. And she ends her story by saying, they will be put in an elevator that doesn't stop at the garage. So I want to close right now by telling you what Jesus said about how to return your revelation, your, your, what am I trying to say? Reservation to the Lord. Thank you. And this is the greatest news you could ever hear in your life. Remember when Jesus told Thomas, he was so confused. And Jesus said, in my father's house, there's many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And Thomas was confused. He was sad. He said in verse five, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? We don't have a map, Jesus. We don't have a GPS system. How can we know the way to heaven? And friends, I don't know if you've ever put these two verses together because they're very famous, popular verses. But Jesus says, Thomas, I know you don't know the way, but you don't have to know the way. Because verse six, Jesus Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Now, friends, look, if you are into the political correctness of our culture today, then that's going to bother you, what Jesus said, because he said, I am the only way. But the reality is, Jesus says, if you miss me in this life, then you miss your reservation in heaven. And if that happens, then one day, just like Ruthanna and Roy, you're gonna hear the maitre d' of heaven say to you, I'm sorry, cannot find your name in the book, you must leave. And the Bible even gives us a kind of script for what this will look like in heaven. God will say, I never knew you, depart from me. Friends, please, whatever you do, don't let that be your script. The invitation is being given out to you today. This is your moment right now to RSVP, to accept Jesus, to accept God's invitation into heaven. Would you all stand to your feet for a closing prayer? I'm gonna ask no one please to walk out of this place until we give the final blessing here today. Please, this is the moment why we come to church right here. All the volunteers, all the music, all the PowerPoint, all the videos were created for this moment right here. Because this is the moment where people pass from death to life. So right now, where every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I wanna pray for every person in this place who will say, Pastor Luke, today is my day. I wanna make my RSVP. I want to make my reservation in heaven. I don't know the Lord. Or maybe you've been backsliding and you feel so far away from God and you just want to make things right in your heart today. Or maybe you're a Christian today, but you're not running for a crown. And that's convicted you today. 
And you say, you know what? I want to tell Jesus today that I want to live the rest of my life for a crown. I want to be faithful. I want the victor's crown. I want the crown of glory. I want the crown of soul winning. This message applies to every person in this place today. So before I pray, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, if you say, Pastor Luke, today, I want to make my reservation in heaven. I want to ask Jesus Christ to be the Savior and the Redeemer of my life. Would you raise your hand just so I know who I'm praying with today? Just raise your hand real high. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. There's dozens, maybe a hundred hands going up in the balconies. Yes. I see. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Anybody? Yes. I see those hands all from the balcony. Thank God. Thank God. And now you lower your hands. And would you say these words right from your heart? Please understand what you're doing right now. You're not asking God to give you a better life. You're asking God to forgive you of your sins. So he'll give you a better life. But what you're doing is you're saying, Jesus, you died. You gave 100% of your life for me. And now I want to give 100% of my life back to you. I want to be your disciple. I want to live my life for you. And if that's you this morning, and you say these words right from your heart to God, just say, Heavenly Father, today I give you my heart. You said in your Bible, if I would ask you that you would forgive me and that you would adopt me into your family and you would take away the old and bring in the new, your presence, your life. And I ask you to do that today. Would you change my life? Change my desires. Change my appetites. I just give you my life today because I believe that your life is better because you're the master. You know how to live life. And I give my life to you today. I confess my sins. I apologize. They were wrong. And to the best of my ability, I'm going to live my life for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just give our, our Lord and Savior a great hand this morning for what he's done? I know we've gone five minutes over today, but I want to pray one more prayer. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. If you leave early, you won't get a crown. Just saying. <laughs> How many of the Christians here today, I was so convicted this week when I researched those five crowns. How many Christians would say, you know what, Pastor Luke, I was convicted by that too today. And I'm gonna make a decision today that I'm gonna live my life with God's help, with God's grace and power. I'm gonna live my life to achieve a crown that one day I can lay at the feet of Jesus Christ. Can I pray for you today? Father, I pray for every Christian who has raised their hand today. Lord, you've called us to be your ambassadors. We are not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven. And Father, we wanna live with live what's rest of the uh, what's rest of our life Lord to to achieving these crowns Lord to be soul winners to to gain victory over something that's got us enmeshed right now God with your strength and power and I pray that every believer in this place Lord would set their eye on a prize and run and run and run this race with vigor God with excitement with anticipation that one day we will get a crown and when we get that crown in heaven, we will lay it at the feet of our hero, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. We love you so much, Lord. We thank you for this great opportunity to run for you, Lord, to live for you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. amen.